Praise the Lord, everyone. Because you can hear my voice and you're not here, you're late. And there's going to be a charge for the altar. Charge for the altar after. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Welcome home. Is this mic working? Good. I thought I would stand. Amen. Our pastor has already uh, mentioned our prayer request this morning. We have prayed. And, uh, but let's pray again for our service. And also, uh, let's remember those, uh, those people again. Sister Frida, Barbara, Frida, that God would uh, move in their lives, that they would touch, raise them up if necessary, and that his will would be done. Let's pray together again. Lord, thank you for your love and your mercy today, Lord Jesus. Have your way with these things today, God, these prayer requests, God. Touch their lives, encourage them, Lord Jesus. Bless them, God. Lord, we pray for our service today, Lord, and our second service, God. And you'll be in our midst and you'll anoint the speaker again, Lord Jesus. And God, your will will be done in this service, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we got some uh, announcements here. Uh, August announcements. And uh, we, got a, we got a busy month. This first chapter of uh, the book of the Bible almost. Well, it's at least one of, one of them is only one page long, isn't it, in the Bible? Amen. Uh, okay. First uh, Wednesday of every month, we get dedicated to understanding in time, which is this Wednesday, August the 3rd at 7 p.m. There's going to be uh, no kids power on these nights. We'll be at our, uh, our uh, understanding in times uh, Bible studies. Sunday, August the 7th, children and adults Sunday school at 10 a.m. At 11 a.m., everyone gathers in the sanctuary for worship and work. Monday, August the 8th, women of work, prayer, and fellowship in the lower auditorium. I really think that they should be leaving the leftovers that they have from all their snacks for the men. I think that should be written and put in. Amen. Uh, okay, and that's going to be at 6 p.m., Wednesday, August the 10th. By the way, that's my son's birthday. Also, our anniversary. This will be Debbie's 47th year, or 48th year of torment. No, no, I'm not that bad. But it is our anniversary. Sunday, August the 14th, uh, children and adults Sunday school at 10 a.m., followed by worship and word at 11 a.m. Monday, I enjoyed Sister Paula this morning. That was really, uh, yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah, she is my wife, by the way. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Sunday, August the 14th, children and adults Sunday school at 10 a.m., followed by worship and word at 11 Monday, August the 15th, Men of Battle Prayer Meeting here at the Sanctuary at 7 p.m. Uh, family Unity Dinner here at the church on August the 21st. Uh, time and sign up will be at the back there, which you're going to be able to make it. There's going to be a sign up sheet, and then the welcome guest definitely next Sunday. Uh, family Unity outing. Uh, building has been moved to Saturday, September the 17th. Repeated. Our family unity opening uh, to Canada. And I'm almost as bad saying it the second time as bad saying it the first time. Okay. Family outing out uh, Upper Canada Village uh, has been moved to Saturday, September the 17th. And some upcoming events uh, Junior Youth Camp. August the 21st to the 26th, Men's Empowerment uh, Conference, August the 8th, 18th to the 20th. Amen. That's it for now. And now our worship teams will come and lead us into the presence of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Doing good. No matter how much you 
practice something. Yeah. And again, y'all can never get it right. <laughs> so we messed it up really good. I give Ash the wrong list. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> okay. First song. Feel
coming into where we are. But he just doesn't show up. He says, I see your need, and I see your need, and I see your need. And so I'm here today to touch you at your point of need. He's been so good. We have that testimony in the house. He's been so good to me. I cannot tell it all. And you can be seated this morning. Piano player, you stay where you are at for a minute. Poor piano player, they always get picked on, you know. Because they like being the center of the test. <laughs> I'm going to preach something to you, and I'll be honest, I don't have an ending to it. I worked on it for three days, don't have an ending. That's all right. That's God's department. This whole thing is God's department. I want to do something a little, little different today, and I'm going to start this way. And uh, hopefully you'll understand why. These are real batons. <coughs> Ushers, if you would come real quick. I didn't talk to them beforehand, but just, just, can you catch? That's pretty good. Woo! Now, the last time I threw something from here, it was a sword. And it was Brother Josh that caught it, so I'll, I'll let him know when you guys at least can catch the tongs. Oh. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. They're going to, and, and, and Brother Tony, I'll get you to. Alright, you got it? Go for it. 
And as you're doing it, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna preach. To talk to you out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and, and we're gonna talk in the I'm gonna read it in the Amplified Version and and that prayer. Well, I told Ashley to put the scripture up, but just trust me. Just trust me that what I'm reading is scripture, okay? Keep that prayer up, buddy, so they can do that. But I'm going to read to the Amplified, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Listen to how it's worded. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight and the sin that does so easily entangle us. Let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us, looking always from all that uh, that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith, the first incentive of our belief, the one who brings our faith to maturity, who for joy of accomplishing the goal set before him endured the cross. By the way, you and I are his joy. Saying there's joy in the cross is like saying there's joy in the electric chair, or there's joy in a hangman's news, or there's joy uh, in the guillotine. There's no joy in the cross uh, until Jesus Christ uh, looked down from that bloody place of torture, and he saw you, uh, and he saw me, and he said, I've got to do this uh, because they need a Savior. And that was the joy that held him on the cross. That was the joy that said, I can't come down. Oh, he could have called 10,000 angels, uh, but he said, I've got something I've got to do. You're his joy today. You're his greatest achievement. You're his greatest accomplishment. Who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Watch this. Revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. Amen. Lord, I love you. I thank you for what you're doing right now. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the prayer that this congregation is praying right now. God, in the next few minutes, as your anointed word comes up out of my heart and out of my mouth, I pray as it leaves my tongue. Your word says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So I'm praying, Lord, that you would anoint my tongue. Help me to speak encouraging words. Help me to have a blessing tongue. Help me to bless your people and lift us up in Jesus' name. Amen. And, you know, I stand before you today with absolute confidence declaring that God desires for every believer to have victory. Amen. Well, I'll say that again until somebody gets on board. It is God's desire that every believer have victory. Amen. In fact, he gives us victory. He doesn't tell us that we have to go find the victory for ourselves. He actually puts victory in our hands. First Corinthians 5 and 57 says, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. Amen. Now, this morning, I guess it is still this morning, yeah. This morning, I'm not suggesting that we're going to reach a point in our walk with God that we're going to be trouble free. If we're breathing... And, and let me just so I know who's breathing and who's not this morning. <laughs> just kind of. All right, everybody's still in the chair, so. <clears throat> if we're breathing, troubles are unavoidable. In fact, Job said in chapter 5 and 7, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. And then he said in Job 14 and 1, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. So I'm not implying that directly following this service, every one of us is going to be exempt from the troubles of life. But I will suggest that you can reach an attitude that says, regardless of what happens, regardless of what I'm going through, regardless of what comes my way, my heart is fixed and my mind is 
just made up that I'm going to finish this race that I have been given the privilege to participate in. See, this morning, victory or defeat has been placed in the hands of each of us. Now, I know that this age-old war that we're fighting, there's going to be negativity. There's going to be pressure. There's going to be struggles. But it's up to you and I, it's up to each one of us to choose whether or not that you and I allow that spirit to intimidate us or overcome us. Right. Because here's the thing. If you and I are afraid of the struggle, if you and I can't stand the idea of fighting, then chances are you and I are going to be defeated and we're going to walk off the battlefield forever. Listen, I'm not preaching doom and gloom this morning, and I'll turn it around. I'm just trying to give us a reality check. But life as we know it is coming to a close. Amen. Right. Even this idea of, well, I've got all kinds of time, I've still got tomorrow. That whole idea of having tomorrow is not even certain. Amen. We don't have time. Now, I'm going to preach to us for a while. Are you all right? You and I don't have time for this easy believism garbage. We don't have time to go through a bunch of religious motions and just appearing like we're a bunch of super spiritual beings. This is life or death. This is win or loss. This is victory or defeat. This is conqueror or conquer. This is heaven or this is hell. See, church, we're in spiritual warfare. I know it's Sunday morning, but it doesn't really matter to me, and it certainly doesn't matter to God. We're in spiritual warfare, and from this moment on, it's going to be blood, it's going to be sweat, and it's going to be tears. See, here's the thing. It has got to be victory at all costs. It has got to be victory in spite of the enemy. It's got to be victory in spite of the battle that comes our way. Because if you and I don't fight, if you and I don't fight for victory, if you, don't, you and I don't fight the claim victory, there's going to be no survivors. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Our families won't make it. The lost won't make it. Prodigals won't make it back into the ark of safety before it's too late. We won't make it into the ark of safety. See, God had a goal in mind when he placed his church on this spinning ball of dirt. And that goal that he had in mind. Go ahead, bro. You can take it. Oh, she's praying. Sorry. God had a goal in mind and he placed his church on this spinning ball of dirt and clay. And that goal was not defeat. That goal was not rolling over and playing dead and saying, if I just pretend, then the enemy won't bother me. No, no. God's goal for his church that he placed on his planet was victory. And it's not was victory. It still is victory. I want to talk to us for this morning on this thought, a victory for the ages. A victory for the ages. Listen. I don't know if you think about this, but the last couple of days I've been really kind of thinking about the importance of the church. But the church is so very important. Amen. Did you know from the Old Testament unto the New Testament, there are 400 years of silence, no sight and no sound from heaven, no tangible relationship between creator and his creation. No messenger, no message. No direction, no supernatural demonstration, no burning bush, no deliverance, no parting seas, no crumbling city walls, no warring angels surrounding cities, no deliverance from hungry lions, no deliverance from burning fiery furnaces, no falling giants, and no consuming fire falling from heaven. For 400 years, nobody had heard a voice from heaven. Nobody has seen or felt the hand of the living God moving. And you already said it, Jesus Christ came on the scene and he begins to preach and teach truth with power and authority. He does many miracles, signs, and wonders and he has a tangible relationship with many. He dies a horrible death on the cross. But he resurrects three days later victorious uh, over death, uh, hell, uh, and the grave. Uh, then he sends his disciples to Jerusalem to wait uh, for a promise. 
And a few days later, on that day of Pentecost, uh, when those powerful rushing mighty winds uh, of the Holy Ghost begin to fill uh, that upper room, and God uh, deposited His Spirit into that 120, and they begin to speak with tongues uh, as the Spirit of God gave them utterance, uh, that uh, was the beginning of the church in this world. And he built his church upon the foundation of who he is. And on the power and the dominion and the authority that he was. You're not ready to hear this this morning, are you? He built his church upon the foundation of who he is. And the power and the dominion and the authority that he possesses. And he gave this eternal declaration that hell would never prevail, never overcome, never succeed at destroying his miraculous blood bought church. Watch what he says in Matthew uh, chapter 16 and 19 in the Amplified. He said, I will give you the keys. That word keys there means authority. I will give you the authority of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you find, forbid, declare to be unproper and unlawful on earth, we have will have already been bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose, whatsoever you permit, declare lawful on earth, will have already been loosed in heaven. Can I just say something? There's so much hell and stuff going on out there. It's time that the church uses the authority that has been placed within us. Notice it doesn't say whatsoever is bound in heaven is going to be bound on earth. Or whatsoever is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth. Jesus put the power of the church. Jesus put the power in the hands of his church. See, God isn't silent anymore. Heaven isn't shut up anymore. Whatsoever you bind on earth, heaven's already bound. And whatsoever you loose on earth, heaven's already loose. And by the power that's in the name Jesus, we've been given authority to bind every critical, hindering spirit that thinks it can block the working of God's power in this sanctuary. Jesus gave his church authority to bind the spirit of fear, to bind the spirit of guilt, to bind the spirit of shame, to bind the spirit of condemnation, to bind the spirit of stress. Come on. But he also gave us authority to ask for his anointing and his spirit to be released in the atmosphere where we are. Why did he give us that authority? Because there's some that walk in and they're bound with chains. But when you and I use the authority that God put in our mouth, we have the authority and chains will be destroyed and barriers will be moved out of the way. And when chains are destroyed and barriers are moved, it's going to cause the lost to be found. And it's going to cause the sick to be healed. And it's going to cost the bound to be delivered. And it's going to cost the blind to be seen. And then the weak to be made strong. And the broken fully restored. I love, I love the authority that God gave to his church. Can I just say the church that started in the upper room? And the church that's sitting here right now is one and the same. You know what that means, Brother Paul? That means abundant life, Pentecostals, isn't part of a different church. We're the same church. We're still connected to the same gospel and the same spirit and the same anointing as the early church. We're of the same blood. We're of the same name. Come on, somebody. We're still part of the apostolic movement in the world today. Now, people say to me, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but I'd say it anywhere so it doesn't matter. Are you Pentecostal? Nope, I'm not. Yeah, that, just messed, that just messed some of you up, huh? Uh, I just destroyed some of y'all's theology. I'm not Pentecostal. Pentecostal is a religion. Pentecostal is a denomination. I love the Pentecostal church. But listen, I am not Pentecostal. I am apostolic. So you might want to call me uh, uh, ap- apostle. How about that? You can call me apostolic. 
apostolic because apostolic simply means those who believe and follow the book of Acts. We believe in Holy Ghost and fillings and we see it. We believe in miracles, signs and wonders and we see it. We believe in living according to the word of God and we do. We believe in repenting and being baptized and living according to God's word. Week after week in churches all over the world, the apostolic movement That's right. Amen. is still alive. Amen. Did you know that every 30 days there are more Holy Ghost fillings, there are more healings, there are more miracles, there are more rays to life than the entire book of Acts? Amen. Every 30 days. Amen. You know what that lets me know? God's church hasn't passed away. That lets me know that God's church is not extinct. Those in the first church, they may have departed, but they're very much alive in our shouts. They're very much alive when, when those that have been made free from the power of the Holy Ghost can lift their hands and say, I surrender it all, but now I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Oh, I realize our language is different than theirs. And our culture is certainly different. In fact, our culture is even different from it was what it was 37 years ago. Yeah. Our songs are different. Yeah. Huh? Our instruments are different. But every time we come together like we have this morning, it's the same church as it was 2,000 years ago. Every time we worship, we're worshiping just like they did. If Peter, James, and John could somehow walk through the back doors into one of our services, they may not understand a word of what we're saying, but they would understand the power and the presence and the anointing. <laughs> started clapping our hands, or we started shouting with a voice of triumph, they would excitedly exclaim, they're doing it just like we did it. And when Paul walked in and heard, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call that scruffy old fisherman would jump to his feet and say, they're still preaching it, just like I preached it. <laughs> same church. It's the same name. It's the same blood. It's the same experience. It's the same Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. Oh, I'm going to be good. Amen. We're a part of them. They live in us. We're a part of their victories. And they're a part of ours. We are the same church. Those great heroes of faith that we read this morning, says that they're all around us today. A great cloud of witnesses. They had their day on the battlefield and their day has long passed. Now they've taken their rightful place on the balcony of heaven and they're watching and they're waiting for us because we're on the same team and we're running the same race. Come on. We're, we're struggling with the same enemy that they're struggling with. I believe that they're wondering. I believe they care about what's happening in the church today. Because whether we like it or not, we're in the last stages of this race. Amen. We're at the last, we're at the finish line, folks. I can see. And so because of that, I, I, listen, I know this race, this battle, this struggle, whatever you want to call it, it's been going on now for thousands of years. But it's our time to shine. Amen. trying to pull the church out of something this morning. It's more than just a shout and a hand clap every now and then. It's more than just feeling the presence of God. It's connected to that presence. Say, God, I want to be a part of what you're doing in the world today. I want to teach a home Bible study and see somebody saved. I want to tell somebody they can be healed. And when we pray for them, they rise up. I want to be a part of the apostolic church in the world today. It's our responsibility. Amen. Our responsibility.
responsibility to fight now. Amen. It's our responsibility to struggle now. Amen. It's our responsibility to sacrifice just like they did. I'm not talking about bringing the sacrifice like Sister Debbie did, about bringing it to the altar, bringing that sacrifice of repentance. I'm talking about sacrificing our time. Amen. Now, I don't have any problems getting money. We're going to do something in here, but let me just say, sacrifice means sacrificing some of our money. Because God gave you that job anyway. And if you take God to the equation, you take money out and you take the job out. Amen. See now you're Amen. I can't depend on Peter, James, and John to pay the light bill. Amen. I depend on you. God depends on you. And that's the way it goes. And when God says, I expect a tenth from your paycheck, he wasn't doing that so the pastor gets rich. He was doing that so the church can continue preaching and teaching the gospel. Right now, I keep looking at my wife because when she tells me that, that I'll stop. <laughs> if I don't stop, blame her. <laughs> the wife before, Brother Tony said, that had a great grandfather. That is a great grandfather. Listen, it's our turn to sacrifice. If that means we got to come to an all-night prayer meeting, then that's the sacrifice we're going to have to make. If that means, what if God said, I want you to pray for five hours on Monday, and when you do, I'm going to bring ten people into the church. How many would sacrifice five hours and pray? If God said... I want to put an expansion on the church because I've got 300 beyond these walls. I've got a church bigger than this one out there. And they're broken and they're discouraged and they're depressed and they're full of fear and they're full of sickness. And if he said, I want you to put your paychecks together and I want you to sacrifice a little more than what you have been so we can build a new building to accommodate them, then we ought to, as a church, say, God, I'm going to do whatever you call me to do. They already sacrificed and so so now it's my time. Amen. Don't worry, I didn't mean to lose you. I'm not going to be asking for any money today. <laughs> but I'm trying to make a point to you. Amen. That's right. I want you to watch what those heroes of faith went through just so you and I could sit here today Amen. That's right. with food in the table, Amen. food on the cover, a roof over our head, Amen. shoes on our feet, Amen. and a few dollars in the bank. That's right. I want you to watch what they went through Amen. just so we could be here today. Hebrews 11, they're called Here's of Faith, says they were mocked, they were tortured, they were chained up, they were in prison, they were stoned to death. Here's what I don't like. David Copperfield has nothing on these guys. They were sawn in half. That's right. And they never came back like they do on the David Copperfield magic show, you know? Is he even alive? Is he even a thing anymore? This person. They were sawn in half. They were killed with swords. They were made to walk around with sheepskin on and goat skin. They were oppressed, afflicted, tortured. They were forced to wander around in deserts, mountains. They had no choice. They were forced. They were forced to live in caves and holes in the ground. They were the heroes who sacrificed, who suffered. Led, who wept, who laid their lives down for this precious gospel so that we could pick up the lead. Now I stopped using the word old, I used the word mature. <laughs> but you know why I love it when I see mature saints of God come into the house? Because I knew they went through some stuff so I could stand here today. Amen. I know the Longs went through some stuff, so I could be here today. So you, I know the Marshalls went through some stuff, and I'm not saying they're too mature. I'm just saying they're more mature than I. <laughs> <laughs> I love looking out and seeing the Louis XVI service, mm -hmm. seeing them worshiping and coming to the altar when there's no right. Louis XVI yeah. church. Amen. This is not their local congregation, right. but this is their church. Amen. Amen.
I'm way off my notes. <laughs> Super. He didn't give them the luxury of going to the ATM and say, okay, let me withdraw all my cash. Mm -hmm. right. They just left everything right. and followed him. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've set up in such a way in my church that I'll take care of you. Amen. You just do what I've commissioned you to do. Mm -hmm. They got, gave up everything they had. I'm not asking you to give up everything you have. Mm -hmm. I don't believe God is asking us for Asking for things that we've been imprisoned, have been imprisoned in our hearts, right. like fear and doubt Amen. and shame and condemnation. And he's saying, I need you to sacrifice those things at the altar. Amen. Celebration of life ought to have. 
that somebody stirred in their heart that, that the Holy Ghost is real, repentance is real, water baptism is real, living a life of a separation in this world is real. And I don't know how it works. All I know is she's not here today. And if she could, she's looking down from the stands in heaven saying, keep on going. Keep on fighting. I'm not here, but I left something in your hands. 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 I left something that you can carry on. And so the angels can see if they don't see us carrying the gospel, if they don't see us carrying the truth, if they don't see us carrying the love of God. My God, I have such a conviction in this building right now. It matters whether we win or lose. It matters whether we succeed or fail. It matters whether we give up or keep pressing forward. It matters. It matters yeah. when we conquer that negative spirit yeah. that's trying to sap yeah. the life out of us. Right. It matters when we choose victory or when we choose defeat. That's right. Because victory and defeat, victory and defeat, victory and defeat mm -hmm. are both standing there waiting. It doesn't push itself on you. That's right. You have to reach out. Right. Victory right. or defeat. Right. Victory is a decision. Right. Defeat right. is a decision. Right. Which one? It's here. Right. It's here. Which one are you going to take? Victory. You know why? Ah, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. Victory. It matters. It matters if we choose victory or defeat. Somebody is depending. Now, I don't know how many of you all's family, these are twins by the way, I don't know how many of you all's family serves God, but I've heard you say to me, I called my cousin or whoever and told him, you need to get to church. This happened at my church today. And this, you know what she's doing? She didn't even realize what she was doing. She's just carrying her baton. Amen. She's just running the race, Amen. passing it on. Amen. She's just choosing victory, Amen. passing it on. That's right. Amen. Somebody out of hell Amen. and work. Right. 
I never want to talk to him or hang out with him. As long as I loved him in Christ and would stand with him Amen. and would pray with him, right. pray for me. But I'm not sinning against God. Right. I don't like everybody in my family. See what's happening.
Sister Marge gets a brand new car? Yeah. Praise the Lord, she says. <laughs> Maybe I'm speaking prophetically, who knows? But if Sister Marge gets a brand new car, don't let the body go down behind her back. <laughs> I can preach like that because I've had people say that to me. If she's rejoicing in that brand new car, we ought to rejoice in that brand new car. One of us is hurting. I'm not saying you should hurt with them. I'm not saying you should get down on the money belt and stop your thumb with them. That's right. But I'm saying you should bear. Take me off the pedestal that some of these puts me on. I make mistakes. I'm always trying to do that. But I'm always trying to find the right of the client. Bring your life. We'll always try to remain connected to the unity of this body. There, he speak muted if he hears a talk to me in three months. Maybe because I know what's going to come out of your mouth is negative, and I'm trying to keep you to go to God. So it matters if you're defeated. It matters if you're victorious. Because your defeat or your victory affects me. It affects us all. We must stand strong together. Because we are the last runners. In this race. Ahead of us is the finish line. In our hands stay in the call that we've carried on from generations to generations that have gone on before us. They ran their race. They were focused. They ran their race with patience. They ran their race with endurance. But now it's your and my feet that pound down that track. It's our lungs that burn. It's our muscles that stretch to their limits as we advance toward the finish line. It matters what we do. It matters how we live. It matters if we keep or lose the faith. It matters if we're unified. It matters how we decide to run this race. Don't get sidetracked. Don't lose your confidence.
because of a bunch of sideline spectators. Sideline spectators will probably always be sideline spectators. God chose you. God chose you to be a runner in this race. And your participation is of the utmost. Probably only a few more steps, Sister Dick. Just a few more feet away. And that trumpet that's been held in storage all these years <laughs> is going to be taken out of storage and it's going to sound. And in one tenth of a second that it takes to blink your eye, you're going to be caught away to forever be with the Lord. So I say, run with patience, run with endurance, keep focused on Jesus, the author and finisher and the mature of your faith. Lay aside every weight of the sin that it tries to entangle us and it surround us because we're almost over the finish line and victory is going to be declared and crowds are going to be passed out. Those heroes of faith have had their day. Those heroes of faith have dreamt about a day of victory. That's why they sacrificed. That's why they prayed. They fasted. They worshipped. They believed God. They trusted God for a better day. And I stand before you today and tell you that better day is here today. We've been chosen for this hour. The baton has been placed in our hands. And it's our responsibility now. We are part of everything they suffered and died for. Amen. We must refuse to quit. Amen. We must refuse to be intimidated Amen. by this sin sick world. We must decide. Will we know defeat? Or will, will we win a victory for the ages? Amen. service, somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, you're always trying to sweet talk the ladies into sweet sex. I didn't think anybody would notice that I was talking to, I was talking to my friend over here about her delicious, the best in the world, the most amazing <laughs> lemon squares I have ever eaten. Mm -hmm. Now that's saying a lot because my mother is quite kind. <laughs> She makes the best. <laughs> See, you gotta have a plan, folks. <laughs> so you can't tell by looking at me because of all the sweets that have come my way. <laughs> but years ago, I was on a team that ran the 1,500-meter relay race. And we were actually pretty good. We actually made it to the New Brunswick Finals, where all the New Brunswick came. And no, I wasn't the water boy. I actually ran. <laughs> but I learned something about running a race with teammates. You never leave your last lap for the weakest runner. Now, that runner who's last doesn't necessarily need to be the fastest. They just need to be the runner who, when the baton reaches their hand, they're determined. I won't quit. Yes. Yes. I won't quit. Yes. Yes. For the last lap, you want a runner that's going to dig deep, and he's gonna, they're going to find the courage and the strength to give it all they got. Not just for themselves, but because they're a part of a team. And they're carrying, when they're running, they're carrying their team's hope, their team's dreams, and the long hours of training and sacrifice. Everything rests upon that last runner's shoulder. Amen. That's right. For the last lap, you want somebody that's going to use every ounce of strength that they have left. For the last lap, you want somebody that their attitude is quitting is not an option. Amen. That's right. So you save your last runner. Save your best runner. Relax. Amen. And I just say that's the physical 
but in the spiritual, God didn't make a mistake. God knew what he was doing when he saved the church, when he saved you and I for this final lap. Because somewhere in God's mind, he knew they can do it. They've got what it takes. They're going to run with courage. They're going to run with patience. They're going to run with focus. Can I just say, church, the baton is in our hands. God chose us for the final moment. God chose us for the victory lap. God chose us for the greatest moment in history. But I are not here by accident. We were born for this moment. We've been built for endurance. We've been built for adversity. We are here by divine appointment. God called us and God equipped us for this race. Not because we're better. That's right. Not because we're holier. Not because we're stronger. Just simply because God put us here. Amen this moment Amen. for such a time as this. He's God. If he wanted Peter here, mm-hmm. he'd have put Peter here. Right. If he wanted John the Baptist here, he would have put John the Baptist here. Mm-hmm. And really, they're not here physically, but they are here spiritually. Mm-hmm. In you and I. It is our job as part of the body of Christ to stand up and preach. Our job is to bring the gospel. God put us here for such a time as this. God trusts that his church is going to finish the race. God trusts that his church that is in the earth today is going to win a victory for the ages. Oh, not the ages to come. The ages that have fought and gone on before us. I want you to think about me. Peter, Paul, David, Moses, Noah. That cloud of witness surrounding us. Every time you and I refuse to listen to the voice of discouragement. Every time you and I refuse to quit. Every time you and I refuse to say no to temptation. Those cloud of witnesses break out with shouts of joy. Every time we fall down on the track and we feel like quitting and we feel like giving up and it hurts so bad, but they're on their feet and they're cheering us on. They're saying, come on, get up. Keep on going. You've got this. You can make it. And every time we do get back up and we shake the dust off and we just keep on keeping on, that crowd of witnesses cheers us on. Just a few more feet and you're going to make it. Church, that's exactly what ought to keep us going. That is exactly what has to keep us going until we cross Amen. the finish line. That's right. Amen. Because when we burst through those pearly gates and we collapse into our coach's arms Amen. and we hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You kept the faith, Amen. you stayed on course, you remain focused on me. You made it. You finished the race. You won the victory of the ages. Enter into the joy. I don't know what's been going on in all of your lives. For the last several weeks, I've felt a spirit of animosity. Oh, we've been unified. And we've been feeling the presence of God, but I feel a spirit of animosity that's trying to. I'm not even going to say what it's trying to do, but here's what I am going to say let's defeat it. Let's not give that spirit of animosity a foothold. Let's not get that spirit of discouragement a foothold. Let's not get that spirit of gossip a foothold. Let's not give that spirit of doubt a foothold. Let's not give that spirit a a fear a foothold. Let's make up in our heart and mind, I'm going to connect with my brother and my sister. And if fear is coming against them, then fear is coming against all of us. And together, we have the power to keep on keeping on. Together, we can fight. Together, we can win.
going to let you go home after this thought. Really, I'm going to dismiss. But we are not running for today. I don't believe. I don't believe there's another generation inside this one that's going to come up for the trumpet of the Lord's sacks. Because if God would destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and all of their whorings and everything that they did, and if God would allow the world to continue on the way it is, then there's a problem. The only thing that's keeping us, keeping this world from being completely obliterated, is he still has a church. He still has a living, breathing entity that stands between heaven and hell and says, you're sick. I can have my church present. You can't come out of that addiction. I'm going to have my church pray for you. You need a miracle in your life? God doesn't always perform the miraculous, but He can. He so desires.
told you just a couple weeks ago, somebody that I love, respect, and trust dearly. Father, when you love something, and he said, Pastor, you talked about feeling unity in church. That old feeling. Did you get mad at them, Pastor? Absolutely not. Because they were right. I said, well, and I tried to make an excuse, perhaps. I said, we are feeling spiritual unity. The presence of God moves. We, we have it. I didn't even think about it. Oh, did I try to insult them like that? Because we weren't really experiencing family unity. We weren't really experiencing the unity that the body's supposed to have. There's one more prayer that needs to be. Loosens from the animosity. Loosens from the animosity. See, I'm saying me, because you, you, you can't change somebody else. I, I can't go and say, God, I need you to, I need you to loose the animosity off the of, of brother Tony Paul. The only way it's going to work is if his heart's convicted and he says, uh, Lucy and I'm lost in the Because prayer changes us. Amen. Prayer changes our hearts. Amen. Prayer changes our attitude. Amen. I want us to pray collectively, but also singly. I want everyone in the building to be saying it, but I want us to say it individually. God, Remove any animosity from my heart. Remove any animosity. Well, I pray that you would forgive me today. Fill my heart with such a love. Fill my heart with your passion for my brother and my sister. Lord, I pray that your blood would cover and cover those prayers that were made today. And when the enemy tries to come around and sneak himself in, I pray, Lord, that you would lift up a standard against him. That we might walk in unity. That we might run with patience and endurance and mature faith. myself up for it. That's just who I am. I love you and I don't want you to be upset and all that stuff, but I will never rush through what God is doing. Amen. We only have a 10 o'clock and an 11 o'clock service. That's our time to be in the presence of the Lord. That's our time to get strength. That's our time for deliverance. That's our time to just glorify and worship God. When we come in this place, I want us to think of the race that we're running. Amen. I got four batons. I'm keeping one of them. But I'll sell the other three to the highest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> Starting at Lemon Squares. <laughs> Man, I, I give you all of them for some Lemon Squares. <laughs> I love you. I appreciate you. And I want to be part of you. I want to be connected to you. And I want you to be connected to me. You know,
know, that's why we can preach stuff like this. Even the folks that aren't a part of this local congregation, we can preach this because we're just the same body. We're the same church. We just keep on going. We... I love you. Go home. Eat something. Eat something. You're fading away.